excited to join us today for our very first virtual Foreign Service Mentor Panel. Uh, we really wanted to be able to um, allow students and just uh, anybody that really wanted and then was interested in the Foreign Service and a career in the Foreign Service and were not able to attend Foreign Service Day this, this spring, to have some sort of opportunity to interact and speak and ask, um, ask some questions to some amazing individuals that have uh, very long careers with the Foreign Service. Uh, my name is Leslie Durham, and I'm with the School for Conflict Analysis and Resolution, and uh, I'm one of four of the team um, that's going to be hosting this today, Matt Myers from Career Services, and Ludwig from the Shar School, and uh, Erica Marquina from Global Affairs. So with saying that, I wanted to remind everybody that we're going to be recording this session today and that if you have any questions, please write it into the chat. And at the very end of our mentors giving their short bios, you can, we're going to open it up to questions at that point. And Erica is going to be monitoring all of the chat. The other thing I'm also going to ask is that when you write in the chat, make sure it goes to all participants, because if it goes to one specific person individually, they might not actually see it. So it's important to uh, put the chat to everybody. Um, and with that, I think I'm going to hand it over to our three esteemed guests, uh, Mr. Paul Denig, Dr. Katherine Dobson, and Ambassador Lisa Kaliski. And I think, Paul, we're going to start with you. And I think actually he was having some problems uh, with his with his uh, computer. So we'll start with uh, Dr. Dobson. Thank you. Um, I'm Katherine Dobson, and I currently teach here at George Mason. Um, but my previous career was with the US Foreign Service. I joined right after I finished graduate school. And I served in the U.S. embassies in Beijing, China, Bogota, Colombia, and then I served in the U.S. mission, which is now an embassy, in Havana, Cuba. I loved my time in the Foreign Service. I highly recommend it. It is it's a great group of people to work with, and it is always challenging and always different. So I will keep my... Uh, description short for now, and I will pass the floor to the esteemed ambassador. Um, hi, I'm Lisa Kubisky. Uh, I am uh, just retired, but I joined the Foreign Service in 1983. Um, I got interested in the Foreign Service um, sort of after doing a lot of things internationally, but I was always interested in um, civics and in current events, what was going on and the, what the United States could do for its own people and what it could do overseas and think questions like that. Um, I went to public schools and to, all the way until I got to college, then I went to private colleges. Um, I took and passed the foreign service exam. That's an exam open to everybody. Um, and while I was waiting to uh, be told that I passed, I spent some time at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. I always say that they're really uh, the ones who taught me um, economics because I had to apply it so, so often I was in the Economic Research Service. Um, overseas, you would think that everybody in the Foreign Service does Latin America and China because uh, Catherine just said that's what she did and uh, that's also what I did. Um, but uh, I rose through the ranks, uh, ended up as ambassador in Honduras, but uh, came up through the economic home. So the actual last job I had was in the Economic Bureau as, um, in, as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for, um, inter uh, for International Finance and Development, which was a pretty cool job too. Um, a while back, I had uh, several tours in China and in Shanghai and uh, in Hong Kong. I watch Hong Kong now with great pain, agony actually, uh, studied some Mandarin and Taipei, and then had some assignments in uh, 
in in Washington D.C. in Main State, uh, that you know the headquarters for the State Department. In the Secretariat is um, a staff assistant in the Under Secretary for Economics's office in the Western Hemisphere Bureau and uh, the Economic Bureau. And I also spent two years at USPR. And we can get into this if you're interested, but uh, I learned a lot um, that I think is really important, not just for me to know, but for Americans to know. I do think diplomacy is super important. And I think it was just uh, not only a, a fun and challenging job to have, it's a great job to have and very important. That's it. And Pablo, uh, you to, uh, come on in now. We are waiting for you to come back. Okay, thank you very much for your patience. My name is Paul Denning, and I would say the origins of my interest in uh, the Foreign Service as a diplomat go back to my childhood. My father was uh, sent by his company out of Pittsburgh to Switzerland, so I grew up in Switzerland for seven years and uh, met uh, my father's international business contacts, and I thought they were really cool and interesting people. And they always taught me a little bit of their language as well. And um, uh, so uh, then uh, when I went to uh, college, I uh, specialized in uh, history and German literature. And uh, then in graduate school, I specialized in uh, European public diplomacy. I thought, uh, wasn't sure I was going to go into a teaching job or not, but at one point the teaching Profession didn't look that good in history, and so I said, I think I'd better take the foreign service exam, which I did. <laughs> and uh, fortunately, they accepted me, and so I started this adventure in 1983. Um, overseas, uh, served um, uh, three times in uh, Yugoslavia, and as it kept getting <clears throat> smaller. Then uh, twice uh, in, well, actually just once in Germany, but at two different posts, Hanover and hum Hamburg. And, um, then uh, uh, concluded my last overseas, oh, I had an assignment down in uh, South Africa as well, Durban, South Africa. Um, and each one of the assignments was uh, fascinating and interesting, both for the country and its issues, and of course, for the people uh, with whom I was able to work. My specialty uh, throughout my career was uh, public diplomacy. And I found that was a sort of a perfect match for me. It combined uh, the intellectual challenge of trying to convey U.S. policies and their context uh, with extensive interpersonal contacts. And uh, that was uh, both exciting and challenging and just a lot of fun. Um, after 25 years in the Foreign Service, I uh, converted to the Civil Service and uh, worked in that capacity for two more years for the Department of State, uh, running an office that uh, had 40 employees and a budget of $5 million. Um, as I think back on it, I think it was the perfect career for me and I wouldn't trade it for any other. Thank you. That's awesome. Does anybody, so I know we have on an entire 50 minutes left to be able to really delve into the questions that I'm sure a lot of you have in regards to any of their careers. Uh, maybe, um, me, I don't know, maybe one of you could explain what cones are. Um, you've talked about the economic cone and you've talked about the public diplomacy cone, but I know that there are more than just two cones. <laughs> so maybe one of you want to tackle what the cones are until we um, start cultivating some questions from our participants. Sure, I, I can do that. Um, cones are specialties, and um, they, uh, the ones that there are are uh, political cone uh, for things like uh, how government is organized, what's going on politically inside a country, or the politics of a country, or political relations between countries. Economics, which is um, every kind of economic issue you can imagine. Public diplomacy, which is the everything category, is how it, it's a strategy of how we talk to the public. And as over time, over the course of the careers of the three of us, public diplomacy has become um, ever more important and part 
actually part of policy formulation, although people used to think of it as just reaching out, but Paul can comment on that. Popular Cone, which is everything from services for Americans to uh, people who want visas. Um, services for Americans, of course, is, you know, if you lose your passport, what do you do? If, uh, if somebody you're traveling with dies, how, what do you do about that? Uh, those are examples of services for Americans. Um, and then the last cone is, uh, and now it's called management, it used to be called administrative. Um, it, it's making sure that our embassies and consulates uh, have what they need in order to do the work. Do they have the people they need? Do they have the, uh, I, I always make a joke and say, do they have the toilets they need? Um, do they, if we need a new embassy building, these are the people who manage that, that process. So those are the, the cones. You can take a, um, you're usually assigned a cone or offered a job in the Foreign Service connected to a cone, uh, but it, it doesn't mean you can't have an assignment, a tour uh, that's usually two or three years that is outside your cone. And in fact, that's actually a good idea. And then when you first come in, um, you almost always will do a consular tour, uh, partly because uh, they need it for staffing and partly because it's good experience. Um, and um, so you'll end up with experience in a few areas. So as you move up, that's actually a very good thing when you need to supervise people who work in different areas. We actually have a question from, and I, pardon me if I uh, completely um, mess up your name, Laurel. Um, wants to know if you can decide what cone you want, or are you like, do you, can you elect the, the cone, or are you um, basically given, told which cone you're going to be by somebody else? I'm not sure I know the answer to that right now. Maybe somebody else does. It used to be you would say which ones you were interested in, and they'd put you in one of them. Well, I Go on, My understanding is that under the current uh, exam system, the uh, applicant indicates pretty early on which cone they want to uh, apply for. And then the, um, every, everything that they're then given uh, in terms of exam material is geared in that direction. And uh, let's say you do opt for the management cone and they conclude you don't have enough experience in that area or academic background or whatever, they'll say, sorry, and then the next time you take the exam, you can opt for a different cone and, and see if it works out better. Paul actually raises a good point. You can take the Foreign Service exam as many times as you want, and it's free. <laughs> that, that the caveat with taking the Foreign Service exam as many times as you want to, there's about a year gap in between when you take it, and if you don't pass it, then you can take it again a year later. Hmm. So hmm. you can, and I've met people that have taken it up to eight times wow. and, have had, and have had a career in the Foreign Service. So I always say, don't get discouraged, play the long game if you really want it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I hate exams, and so I said to myself, I will take this exam once. If you want me to be in it, I'll get through. He did. Oh, we had another uh, question. Is the uh, person is currently pursuing a PhD in health service research? They wanted to know what are your recommendations for studying for the foreign service exam? Any tips? Well, I think the three of us took it quite a long time ago, but the advice always used to be um, read uh, uh, some of the better newspapers that also cover international news, New York Times, LA Times, Washington Post, uh, Atlanta's, um, what is it, Journal Constitution, or I got that name mixed up in, the, in Chicago as well. Uh, read some of those papers uh, every day or The Economist and um, make sure you can read a, a, a bar graph or some sort of graph, a simple one, 
make sure, pay attention to how governments are organized, know just a little bit about um, government structures. Um, and and my, I don't know, my husband used to call it trivial pursuit, but the rest of it is, is um, fairly common sense of, you know, how would you handle this situation or how would you handle that situation? Also, be sure you can um, write clearly mm -hmm. and express yourself clearly and kind of to the point. But in, um, in public health, I think that's what you said you were uh, studying. Um, there's another uh, career. It's not the generalist foreign service. It's um, a more specialized track because the foreign service actually has doctors and um, nurses in it and they uh, they work both in Washington and they work overseas and it, usually in embassy some in most embassies um, and so that's another path you could pursue you might also consider AID uh, the agency for international development because they have do considerable work in um, health services whether it's uh, HIV or other disease prevention, uh, there may be doors open for that in that area. Um, it's, it is a, an aspect of foreign service, but it's not the foreign service generalist. And yeah. you can actually find some of those right now on USA Jobs. There are a fair number of openings that uh, are being advertised right now. Maybe I'll just add one other tip. Uh, in addition to the traditional written exam with its questions, part of the examination process now invite, involves writing several essays. And it's my understanding that it's okay for you to have a trusted friend uh, read through what you've written and see if it makes sense. So if you do have a, a friend or a former mentor or whatever uh, who uh, is a clear thinker and has good control of the English language, uh, you might have them take a look at your essay and uh, see if it's as good as you want it to be. Um, we have another question from a student who said they're actually interested in becoming a DS agent, which would allow them to hold the billet as RSO within the U.S. foreign missions. Is the foreign service exam still necessary for RSO? And also, what impact does the RSO have on mission diplomacy? As far as I know, the RSO does not have to take the Foreign Service exam. It's a, it's a different application process. And uh, a lot of the people taking the positions as RSOs do have law enforcement experience. Um, and it, but it is a, a different path. But, they do have an important role to play, particularly if you're in one of the more high risk areas, um, it, it, depending on the type of uh, security threat you're facing, whether it's the uh, physical threat of uh, car bombs and things like that, or um, other forms of uh, attack, or you're looking at a place that we're dealing with a lot of um, electronic surveillance, it depends. You yeah, need different characteristics for those different uh, types of security. Yeah, it's um, it's a really great job to be to do DS to do diplomatic security in, in the State Department. It has uh, the one hand that Catherine was describing of uh, protecting the uh, the U.S mission, the US, all the people in the U.S. Embassy, all the physical plants of the U.S. Embassy, all of that. It also has um, the job of kind of being the generalist for all different law enforcement agencies who might be at post. And the, the DS, the RSO, the regional security officer, is usually a close advisor to the ambassador and to the deputy chief of mission. Deputy chief of mission is the number two uh, right under the ambassador. And so um, it, it, as an advisor, it, 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 that person 
can, can share a little bit about how the different law enforcement agencies are coordinating, but it can also, that person also has good advice on what should we be doing. And if you're in a country um, where security is one of the issues we work on a lot, they're usually part of the process of helping uh, the ambassador, deputy chief mission, everybody else think through what is it that this country needs and what should we be doing? So it, it has uh, a little, it, it is a law enforcement position, but it has a little bit of a policy angle. Um, so I think it's kind of a, a, a cool job. It's a great job. And we have another question. Is there anything, any requirements you need before taking the exam? Um, no, I mean, you have to be able to read and write in English, but <laughs> because the exam's in English, but um, you don't need a degree. They don't really care uh, whether you have a degree or not if you can pass the exam. Of course, if you have a degree, it might help, but but you don't need it. Mm -hmm. And then maybe you have to, uh, I, my colleagues can answer, do you, do you have to be an American? Maybe you have to be yeah. American. You do have to be a U.S. citizen. Yeah. And along those lines, with, uh, someone else was asking if there was an age limit for taking the exam. Mm. I think it may be 55 at this point. Uh, and the only reason for that is they do want you to serve a certain number of years after you get accepted. So it's it's pretty pretty wide open. Here's yeah. a fun fact about that. When I started first learning about everything foreign service, the diplomat in residence at the time in DC had told me that the average age of the person entering into the foreign service was 32. So it really runs the gamut everywhere from, you know, the early 20s all the way up into mid 50s. So, um, yeah, that's true. Not all that many 22 year olds, in other words, people right out of college pass the exam. Uh, some do. Um, uh, the ones who come in around in their 30s, they tended to have done a lot, all different kinds of kind of interesting things uh, for a few years, then that experience is, is helpful to them, uh, both for the exam, but for later on too. Another question from a student. They said, as a Puerto Rican, I would like to go into Latin American foreign affairs. Well, which recommendations do you have for entering the Latino field? Where should I apply? Where it can open doors? I was thinking the OAS and organizations like that. Catherine, do you want to take a shot at it? <laughs> I'll let you go first. <laughs> okay. Well, um, within state, if you come in as a generalist, um you're signing up for worldwide service although they they do look at uh what your language is and what your background is and um it's uh pretty likely that you will have it you know a, a latin america type assignment that's in the state department outside the state department there are all all sorts of organizations um the Organization of American States is one, but remember to you know to the Organization of the United of American States, you're uh, a U.S. citizen, right? You're you know the little not just Puerto Rico, and um, if you're on the economic side, there's the Inter American Development Bank. That's another place you could look. There is uh, every kind of non-government organization think tank like the dialogue, it used to be called the Inter-American Dialogue, uh, or some that are a little more politically skewed, uh, like WOLA is another example of one. But um, almost every organization has some sort of Latin America group in it. I mean, it, there's, oh, there's also the Pan-American Health Organization, 
And of course, uh, as Catherine mentioned earlier, the U.S. Agency for International Development. So these are some of the examples, but uh, you have many, many, many choices. Um, I had a question. Can you still work for foreign service as a dual citizen? Um, I don't know the answer to that question. You could probably find the answer on the State Department website, but I don't know the answer to that either. I have a number of friends who are naturalized citizens who became foreign service officers, but I do not know whether they maintained uh, the other citizenship. Thank you. And we have another question from a student. Would you recommend going through graduate school first? I want to enter the foreign service. I have been learning Mandarin for several years, have passed several practice foreign service exams. Uh, does graduate school help your entrance placement in the foreign service? What should I have on my resume to give me the best chance of working in the U uh, for the U.S. in China, Southeast Asia? Well, there's always a high demand for uh, people who speak Mandarin and, and can work in China. Um, they, uh, the foreign, in the foreign service, they really don't care what degree you have. They care whether you can pass the exam and how well you express yourself and how long, how well you get along with other people that you're going to have to work with and, and uh, how well you can represent yourself overseas. So it's a personal decision of, for you. You can take the exam and see if you pass it. On the other hand, if you want to gain more um, substantive uh, background, you know, more historical background or political background or economic background, then graduate school can make sense. But it, it doesn't affect your salary and it doesn't, it doesn't usually affect whether you're going to pass the exam or not, I, I don't think. The main advantage of going to graduate school, which I did, uh, is I think uh, in terms of your ability to function as a foreign service officer once you're in, uh, it gives you a little bit more time to uh, gain personal maturity, uh, more experience in uh, interacting uh, with other people. And uh, I have never regretted any substantive knowledge that I've gained. So those are all examples of things that can help you uh, once you do get in. But it's not necessary to, uh, for you to pass the foreign service exam or even to improve your chances. I can add one more thing. I have a master's in foreign service from Georgetown University, but my undergraduate degrees, I had a dual major in anthropology and psychology. And um, so when I went to Georgetown, that, that's where I got the economics and the, um, a politics or the government part, but I always thought that as a, as, a, as a diplomat that the anthropology and the psychology were the, the fields that helped me the most because you're pr constantly trying to interact with people, understand what was going on in their societies, bring it back to the United States, and also relate to them and, and present the United States back to those people. So, um, you know, it's kind of, that's just a personal anecdote. Another question from a student said, many times it feels like you need connections or a network to get a job in foreign service, but do you just take the exam? You just take the exam. I, I was, I took the exam twice. Uh, the first time I was a senior in college and I took the foreign service exam, the GRE and five three hour finals in the space of a week. Um, yeah, that, that's a little much. Um, most of you have just gone through finals. Imagine if your three hour final really lasted three hours. That was what I was dealing with. But I didn't pass that first time. 
And I went to graduate school. And I exactly one year later, I signed up and took the foreign service exam. And at that point in time, I was in Georgia. Um, and I didn't know anybody in the foreign service. I took the exam. My scores across the board went up 20 points in every category. Um, I passed in all the different categories, um, except economics, which had been my undergraduate major, which is really funny. <laughs> I think I must have overthought the question. Um, but I went from there and to taking the oral exam. And after a certain amount of time, I got a phone call. And I was told I was in the top third of the political register, and I was at the top of the public diplomacy register. And I said, oh, I'm not realizing the top third of the political register meant that I was, I was probably going to be called to be political. I didn't know that, but I heard what public diplomacy did, and I said, that sounds like me. So I took the public diplomacy job, and I didn't know anybody coming in. I knew no one. Um, now some of my dearest friends are, are foreign service officers or former foreign service officers. But I didn't have any connections. They are, it, this is really merit-based. Point oh, out. And I should say something it. else too. You probably can't notice, but um, I only have one hand. That's, I gesture a lot with my hands, but I only have one hand. And the Foreign Service did not do anything different for me because I, I wasn't picked. I got in by taking the exam. There was no special track for somebody with a disability. Um, and it, it was also, it's also something for you to realize that the Foreign Service takes all kinds of different people. They take all kinds of different people. There are people who use wheelchairs who are in the Foreign Service and they're serving overseas. Um, there are people like me. So there are a lot of different types of people that get in. That's just a, a little aside there. But I didn't know anybody. You don't have to have some kind of connections to get in. I wanted to mention, just in case, um, before you guys hop off this in a, in a little while, to ch if you're on Facebook, to really join the DOS Diplomat and Residence DC Metro page because um, Yolanda, who is right now the diplomat in residence, she hosts a lot of kind of groups for people that are interested in joining the service. So some of these questions you can ask there. She'll have a test dates, like how to practice tests or, you know, meetups for a lot of people that are interested in joining the foreign service. And you have a direct link to the diplomat in residence to ask specific questions that maybe I notice a lot of people have very specific questions to, to their own situation and their own kind of desires. She would be a great person to also follow up with. So I highly suggest you join this Facebook page. Another question from a student, and Catherine, you did mention that you were an economics major. Uh, do you have degrees that Typical, that are typical related to foreign service, such as economics and international relations? My undergraduate degree was in economics with a double major in management, and my um, master's degree was in political science. My PhD is also in political science. But, that does, but there are people who major in all kinds of different things. One of my dear friends, uh, was uh, all the dissertation in comparative literature. So people study all kinds of different things. I'll tell you just with my years of, I am not foreign service, but my years of doing this and meeting so many wonderful people that have served, there's been people from all backgrounds, walks of life, different career paths, maybe switching. I've met teachers that decided they didn't want to be teachers anymore and they wanted to join the service. I've met people that were nurses. I've met people from former military, you name it. It just, it, I don't think necessarily like Dr. Dobson said that it matters what you study. I think it really all comes down to what are your characteristics that the service is looking for at the time when you are taking the exam and also being able to, when it, when it comes to, because I think Paul mentioned this a little bit prior, um, the narratives, there's these six narratives that you'll have to take and they just redid this part of it, and I think you alluded to that this mm -hmm. last year, 
And those six, six narratives are actually being um, kind of pegged up against everybody else that are taking those same narratives at the exact same time. So how is your narrative going to be the most interesting and the most unique and how is it going to stand out? Because everybody's going to come with really interesting stories about whatever prompts they're going to give you. So how does yours look? you know, that much more intriguing for them to get you to the oral exam um, process. So, but I think going back to, I think it really doesn't matter what you study. I think it matters more about what you know as far as um, international, like all of the current events, like you said. I also, you mentioned all those magazines. I also heard that reading The Economist was a really good one to read. Mm -hmm. Like I, you see that over and over again. Read the Economist. I almost pick up the Economist now and start reading it because I'm like, I should be reading the Economist. <laughs> so yeah, there's so many tricks to being able to do this. Anyway, my two cents again. I have a lot of them. <laughs> and Ambassador and Mr. Dinnick, uh, what was your um, uh, degrees in? Paul, well, why don't you go first? Okay. Uh, my undergraduate uh, degree was in uh, history, and I took a variety of different courses, and I found history to be an excellent background. And my other major as an undergraduate was uh, uh, German literature, which I dearly loved. And then, as I say, in uh, graduate school, I uh, uh, got a master's degree in uh, uh, European diplomacy, and then uh, uh, was an all but dissertation uh, specialist in European diplomacy as well. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay, so my undergraduate uh, major, double major in uh, anthropology and psychology, I actually thought I was going to become an archaeologist at one point. Um, and then I had a, a certificate, which was the same as a minor in Latin American studies. And then for graduate school, um, it was a master's in foreign service, which was about a year of government and a year of economics or politics and economics. They, uh, within that, they had, at the time, they had some different specialties. So mine was economic development, which was a little bit more on the economic side. Thank you. We have another question from a student. Which has been the most challenging part of foreign service, uh, your experience, and which has been the most rewarding part of being in the foreign service? The, um, I think the most challenging uh, is, it, the, the, I can think of two things. One is when you're dealing with a government that totally doesn't agree with you, it's a challenge to find the common ground and figure out how to encourage uh, cooperation on issues where we're looking for cooperation. Um, they, uh, when you, well, and the, the second area is when you disagree with our government's own policy, we're not hired to represent our personal views, we're hired to represent the elected government. Um, so um, right now that would be President Trump and Secretary of State um, uh, Pompeo, since he was appointed by Trump. Um, so you, that's where the, that can be a challenge if you don't agree, but you have to be careful about what you choose to work on and how you, you know, how you choose to present it. The most rewarding part, that's probably quite an individual thing. Um, in my very first tour, I ended up coordinating um, search teams after the Mexico City earthquake of 1985, um, September 85. There were a couple of earthquakes actually. We um, search team as in search and rescue. Um, the teams I coordinated actually saved lives and I, there's been nothing that has matched that in personal satisfaction of being able to um, save lives. Um, but the, the second thing is, uh, and it's kind of related in, uh, if I think of Honduras, um, 
or pretty much anywhere, you, but especially the higher up you go, you, you represent the United States to um, ordinary people overseas. And the way you act um, is, um, you know, sometimes what the main thing they know about the United States, or uh, it might present a different image from what they uh, thought about the United States. And that is also very rewarding. So the, the personal interactions I, I found really, really enjoyable and stimulating. I guess I could add getting things done, you know, making policies that, that make the United States and hopefully the other country better. Um, that's also extremely rewarding. Paul, do you want to say something? Sure. In terms of uh, the most challenging, I'm going to, um, in both, I have two examples and I'll point to uh, my experience in Sarajevo, uh, in Bosnia, in both cases. Um, the uh, first time that I was there uh, back in the mid 80s uh, was a time when uh, Yugoslavia was still communist and the US, of course, the leading capitalist country. And uh, the official policy was very standoffish to, toward the United States. We were the running dogs of imperialism. And so trying to get across uh, our policy message uh, was, uh, was very difficult. And uh, I uh, tried as much as possible to do it through uh, uh, the uh, tools of economics and environmental protection, uh, two sort of non-touchy areas uh, that they could agree on and were very interested in. Uh, then the second most challenging, and this was uh, physically challenging, if you will, uh, was uh, 1997 when I was sent back to Bosnia right after the shooting war had ended. And uh, there were still a lot of people running around with very heavy uh, weapons. And uh, the Serbs were extremely hostile, um, uh, both to Americans as well as to the local Bosnian Muslims with whom we were trying to work. And uh, uh, at one point, uh, the Bosnian driver had a, an accident and uh, the Serbs, uh, Serb police wanted to arrest him and uh, probably throw away the key. And, uh, but fortunately, I was able to get in touch with the international police force and they came by and, and uh, called the Serb police down. Uh, in terms of uh, rewarding, um, in my business, the uh, public diplomacy, one of the rewarding things is when your audience gets the point. And sometimes it's the main point. Sometimes it's another point that wasn't the main point, but it's still very important. Example, uh, during the uh, first uh, Gulf War under President George H.W. Uh, uh, Bush, um, uh, each one of us in Germany in our branch post decided to handle that in a different way to try to persuade the Germans. I decided to hold a series of uh, programs uh, featuring um, uh, one person who was uh, you know, very much in line with the, the president's approach. Uh, another was a Palestinian American. Third one was a, uh, an academic who took sort of a balanced point of view. And uh, I still remember at the end of the um, uh, presentation by the Palestinian American uh, professor, uh, and he was critical not just of our policy in that first Gulf War, but American foreign policy period. Um, uh, one of the gentlemen in the audience came up to me after and said, Mr. Denning, only the United States has enough uh, confidence, self-confidence to put on a program that the government pays for that is even critical of itself. <laughs> and I thought that's really cool because that shows that we really do have freedom of thought and freedom of expression. So he got it. Um, another uh, rewarding aspect of my work was uh, when I was able to help uh, foreign students um, come over to the U.S., maybe a small grant here, advice on something else, and they come to the U.S. and, uh, and get some either general or specialized education. And finally, you know, we all have our formal jobs as diplomats, but there's often ways that we can informally help people just by the personal uh, contacts and relationships that we've uh, managed to establish. I'll give you an example. So after I served in Bosnia in the mid-'80s, I was in, uh, in the early 90s, I was in uh, Germany, in Hanover, Germany. And that's exactly when uh, Bosnia was blowing up. The uh, civil war was raging. 
uh, in Yugoslavia. And several of our contacts uh, came out of the country because things got literally too hot for them. And they came through Hanover and we were able to help them uh, on, uh, whether it was to France or to the United States. And uh, so we li literally did help to, uh, to rescue people. It does make a difference. I mean, I think that's, we have to remember that all of this is about people's lives and whether it's helping uh, somebody who's leaving Bosnia. Um, there were people who needed to leave Cuba, um, contacts of mine, whether uh, I mean, somebody who had just been uh, imprisoned for uh, uh, defying the Cuban government and was kept in solitary confinement mm -hmm. and then was given 24 hours to leave the country. Um, it, Solano had been one of my friends from the time I reached Cuba and uh, it was it was very personal. Um, at the same time, uh, there are people in all the countries where I've lived that mean a lot to me, and I have uh, the memories, and I can think back and and the extraordinary things I was able to be a part of, whether it was starting being involved with the migration uh, resolution of a migration crisis out of Cuba um, in 1995, where uh, Many, many people had been lost at sea and working, uh, actually collaborating with the Cuban government for the return of rafters who were picked up at sea and being there for the first time, a Cuban Coast Guard cutter, excuse me, a U.S. Coast Guard cutter came into Cuban waters since the 1950s. It was extraordinary. It was extraordinary to be able to be part of that. And I think, you know, one of the things you're hearing from all three of us from our different places and our different jobs is we all had extraordinary experiences. Mm -hmm. yep. Thank you. Another question from a student. Did anyone have family while serving? I read it that that is challenging. Um, yeah, I had uh, a husband. In fact, he he and I agreed to get married because the Foreign Service gave uh, uh, covered more of the expenses and and gave bigger living space to married couples and singles. Um, and then we had uh, two two children together. I also have a stepdaughter, but the stepdaughter stayed in the U.S. with her mom. But the uh, it 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 is it's challenging and rewarding too. Um, and every family situation is different. Um, it, and very, it's very, very individual. Um, when uh, my husband and I entered the Foreign Service, same year as Catherine, um, they, uh, there weren't too many um, uh, what they called trailing spouses, husbands, who were not the Foreign Service officer. And that was a an issue of society in the United States too, that if it wasn't the husband who had the bigger uh, paycheck and the, and the greater professionalism, you know, that, that, that was socially a little bit difficult. Um, so there was an adjustment you need, you know, in that case I, I needed and I had a husband who had enough inner strength to deal with, with that and know that we were doing the right thing. Um, for the kids, it's uh, actually, I think it's a little bit of a crapshoot. Sometimes, as in my case, it turned out really well. Every time we moved, it would take a little bit of time for the kids to make their new friends. So they always had a period where they were deal, you know, they had each other. And um, that seems to have strengthened their relationship over time. So they're very close now, even though they don't live in the same state, um, because they had these uh, times at the beginning and ends of tours when they were, uh, where they were depending on each other. 
and we're very close to them too. But it doesn't always work out that way. Sometimes the kids hate each other and then it, it could be worse. Um, but what you do find is um, a lot of the foreign service kids, um, they tend to learn diplomatic uh, skills very uh, early and they learn how to um, uh, deal with, you know, build a community of people around them, um, you know, walk into situations where they don't know people and, and handle that uh, very well. And then they learn funny little things like uh, when my when one of my sons was 13 and my uh, sister was getting remarried, asked him to bring out the hors d'oeuvres at the wedding party. He actually went around and served all the hors d'oeuvres, went around person to person because that's what he had seen. Um, so that's just a funny anecdote. But the more serious thing is, uh, it is something you have to pay attention to and you have to manage, but the rewards are, are can be very great. I mean, they both uh, my boys have a very good understanding of the world and a very good understanding of how to move in it. I went overseas initially with uh, a wife and who was a classical violinist. And uh, for most of our career, unfortunately, overseas, it was very hard for her. Initially, we thought how violin will travel, but it didn't quite work out that way. In uh, Yugoslavia, we uh, met with suspicions. Uh, they thought that my wife was a spy. And didn't want to let her play with the local orchestras. Uh, in Germany, uh, to play with one of the orchestras, they were all German civil servants, and there was an age limit and my wife was over the age limit. I took care of that. So it really wasn't until we hit South Africa that her mm -hmm. overseas music career blossomed, but it really did blossom. She played with two orchestras, was concert master with one of them, and uh, uh, taught uh, uh, previously uh, underprivileged uh, youths, uh, non-whites, um, um, uh, violin and uh, organized a whole program for the local performing arts center. So it sometimes it takes a lot of patience and stick to itiveness to to be able to practice your career as the uh, as the spouse. In general, it's um, it's easier if you have a very portable career, and I'm not talking about violin because I just gave you that bad example. But <laughs> if you are say a photographer or you're a writer or you can do all your work by internet, then that's a very transferable uh, career. But if you're in any one of the professions that is licensed, whether it's medical doctor, uh, nurse, architect, lawyer, et cetera, there it can become very iffy in terms of whether you get employment, especially employment you might like overseas, just because of the relationships of countries and the various rules that exist. So uh, my general advice for that is um, uh, be very frank with someone you're thinking of maybe marrying and saying, hey, it could be tough especially if they're, as I say, in a licensed profession. And, um, and so it's good to go in with your, with your eyes open. Uh, in terms of kids, the first challenge we had was, okay, we were in Bosnia, my wife got pregnant, I helped, of course. But um, uh, then the question was, well, where does the birth take place? And all of our Yugoslav friends said, don't have the baby here, our hospitals are terrible. I found out later that was really true. So the Foreign Service gave us the um, choice between a German, I mean, a, an American military hospital in West Germany or going to an Austrian uh, public hospital in Vienna. Well, two nanoseconds later, I said, we'll go to Vienna, and which turned out to be wonderful. We got the, uh, the, the head of the gynecology uh, section of the hospital, took care of Lynn. They gave her a private room and no extra charge, et cetera, et cetera. Wonderful experience. Uh, the next challenge with kids, of course, is schooling. And one of our hopes is that uh, our daughter could remain with us uh, rather than sending her to private school in the U.S. Colleagues who have done that have sent them to the U.S., have positive experiences. The Foreign Service does pay for it, but we really wanted to bring up our own, our own child for 18 years. And fortunately, it turned out that way. We were able to find good schooling for her. Um, at post uh, in, in each case. Um, another challenge, of course, is language training. And my advice there is 
fight for as much language training for your spouse as possible. The State Department tends to go through cycles. Sometimes they give a lot of language training. Other times they really skimp. So it's up to you to go to your career counselor and others and be very forceful and say, hey, my spouse is the one who has to be on the economy all day. I'm sitting comfortably in the embassy with local employees who can translate for me. So you better give my spouse good language. And you now if you argue, you get. <laughs> and I was single. <laughs> <laughs> That's easy. <laughs> I can uh, go back to um, my husband. His field at the time we married was international labor, and he thought he would get a, a job with uh, the first tour with Mexico with um, one of the uh, with the Mexican Labor Confederation. And um, first, they didn't really want uh, non Mexicans uh, working with them. And second, he really doesn't have such great language skills. And so uh, that absolutely didn't work out. And so when we got back to the States, he went back to school and he got a degree in um, something more portable, which was journalism. And he got a job, uh, which he's had ever since, um, working for a trade publication, doing fertilizer trade reporting. And um, that is very portable uh, because it, it basically he could do a lot of it over the phone. Um, and that and so that that worked out, but it did take a little time to make the adjustment. Well, we have time for one more question um, if anybody has or if we have some closing thoughts. Um, maybe I think we've actually answered all of the questions that were in the chat. Um, so we have a couple of minutes just to wrap up and see if there's any final thoughts maybe from the three of you that you want to, your last words to impart to the group. <laughs> and I also wanted to, before I, um, before I uh, let you guys go, if, if anybody has any questions um, in regard to any one of our panelists, please let me know if that is um, something that you need, if you have a question, and then I can forward your information to them. Um, or if they would like to give me their email address, then I can put it out and you guys can do it directly. So whichever you guys want to do. Um, well, oh, and actually somebody just asked a question. Uh, is the Foreign Service um, a part of the military? No. No, no. <laughs> I'm like, I, I can answer. I, I'm actually a military spouse, so I, I can answer that one. But and, yeah. And in fact, I'll, I'll share with you when I was out in the field overseas as a public diplomacy officer, I was sometimes, particularly in communist countries, uh, suspected of being a spy, part of the CIA. And so I explained <laughs> to them very simply the difference. I say, we do the exact opposite. The CIA collects information and we distribute it. <laughs> it's simple enough that they got it. <laughs> I do have some final thoughts if we still have a moment. Yeah, um, please do. The, um, when you go overseas, whether you go with the State Department or some other way, uh, it teaches you what people think of the United States, at least people in that country, and where our place, where the place of the United States is in the world. And that's a very important thing, because if you live only in the U.S., there's so many Americans who don't have that awareness. Um, it also uh, teaches you in a very personal way, what is it that we in the United States value? Who are we really? And uh, because you're constantly putting that out, both because it's just you personally, but also, but more importantly, because it's you as, a, as an, an American. Um, there are a lot of lessons for the United States. Uh, I learned, everything about crisis management by working crises overseas with the, the team from the uh, U.S. Agency for International Development, things that are incredibly useful here in the United States, like what you do if there's a flood or a, you know, a famine or an earthquake or a pandemic for that matter. Um, and then you get a lot of management leadership skills that serve you anywhere, anytime. So um, the, Diplomacy is incredibly important. You, you know, our most 
enduring relationships. They're ones where that are built on mutual interest and finding that common ground is, is super important. And um, for at least the years of the of the careers of the three of us, um, you know, we, we always modeled the U.S. overseas, and that was a model that many, many, many people in the world looked up to. And that was gratifying to know. Plus, it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> I guess my final thought would be, if you think you would like a career of service to your fellow human beings, then the Foreign Service is, uh, is a great way to do it. You're both serving your, your countrymen back here at home, but you're also serving people all around the globe. And we really are in a global village. So everything that you can do to make um, democracy and prosperity and human rights and all those things better in foreign countries, in the end, will come around and uh, be a blessing for the United States and its citizens. Mm -hmm. And following up on both of those, I encourage you to pursue the career with the Foreign Service, especially if you're, you have that interest in service. It is not always easy. Um, there will always be difficulties. But it is a valuable service both to this country and to people in other places. Thank you so much for taking your time um, for joining us today. And I think this was extremely valuable. Um, and I'm really excited that our students were able to have a chance to ask some questions. And there were a lot of questions all over the place. So this is this, this is a good thing. That means that this is really needed. Um, mm -hmm. Would it be OK to put your emails into the group, the, the chat? Sure. Yes. OK. Excellent. Uh, one more question, though, before I leave with somebody, uh, Carter asked, and I was about to uh, put into the group chat. He says, are there any books that you would recommend um, for further information about the Foreign Service or International Affairs in general? The American Foreign Service Association, AFSA, has put out several books uh, about what it's like to work in a U.S. Embassy. So if they were to look up uh, AFSA, AFSA publications, they would find those. And that would give them uh, a lot of good nuts and bolts uh, uh, information about how it is to be a diplomat overseas. Uh, in addition to that, um, I'd recommend perhaps memoirs of our uh, ambassadors um, over the years. Um, yeah. Georgetown University also publishes from time to time a book called Careers in International Affairs, I think it's called. I, I was in it one year, uh, and it's chapters written by people in different aspects of international affairs on what that career is like. So that would be another uh, good idea. But, you know, when I what I did um, before going to each country I went to, was to try to find books about the country. And sometimes it was a straight history book. Um, the ones I tended to like a lot were either um, uh, some kind of fiction that uh, showed you something about the culture of the place or, um, or books by journalists who had been there, you know, in the last 20 years because journalists tended to write in a very easy to way, uh, way to absorb. So um, that, but that was sort of country specific or region specific. Would you guys mind, I have Paul's um, email up there, but I don't have uh, Dr. Um, Dobson's or Dr. Timothy's right. I thought you could uh, say it and then I, I can I just write it in. So. Oh, you did? Okay, perfect. It's Lisa at Kubiski.org. Lisa Kubiski. At Kubiski.org. Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much.
Um, if anybody has any further questions beyond this chat and uh, about anything related to what we might be doing in the fall, we're going to hopefully host a networking night if everything goes to plan. <laughs> Cross our fingers. And then again, a foreign service day in the springtime. So I really hope that um, you are all able to attend either or both of those events. And to our panelists, thank you so much for joining us today. You're very welcome. We enjoyed thank it. Thank you for hosting. It was well, great. Thank you for the opportunity. Absolutely. Yep. Have a wonderful afternoon, everybody. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.